All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining Atomic Friday. Um, we are going to be discussing some new and improved Invoke Atomic Red Team features. We have a, a guest joining us today. Um, so hopefully you know who I am, I'm Michael Haig, um, working on my beard again. So hopefully over time, this will be real. <laughs> and I um, want to introduce everybody to Carrie. Um, Carrie, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself here. Thank you okay. for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, if you want to go ahead to the next slide, a little intro slide there. Sure. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I'm admitting that I'm old and I can only remember back a few years. The last I could remember, I was a pen tester at Black Hill and then I graduated from Stan's Technology Institute, which I'm super proud of in 2015. Then I became a red teamer at Walmart and now I'm blue team. So trying to figure awesome. it all out and having lots of fun. And just a disclaimer that uh, views and opinions are my own. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yep, and uh, we are recording, so the recording will get sent out to everybody after. And if you would like to follow along at home, everything will show you the links here in a second. Um, and if you have any questions as we progress, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box and we will get them answered. Um, get started. Huh, getting started. <laughs> okay, so I'm actually pretty new to Atomic uh, Red Team stuff. I heard about it for a while, but just getting started with it. So I'm still sensitive to the fact that not everybody knows what it is, and it can be a little overwhelming to uh, not know what it is. So I put in a couple intro slides here. Just a reminder, Atomic Red Team is really like little tests that you can run that, sim that simulate an attack so that you could look at your detections and say, okay, we're getting good coverage here and we're missing something here. So they're repeatable. You can run them on a regular basis. Um, they're all mapped to the MITRE attack framework. Um, so kind of industry standard, easy to compare your coverage with other people. So if you go onto the GitHub, Red Canaries GitHub for Atomic Red Team, you'll find in the Atomic folder index file, and that'll list all the atomic tests and for each one individual attack. And so that's a good place to start to say what, you know, what kind of things could I emulate and attacks could I do if I got started with atomic red team. So that's a good place to start listening. Okay, go ahead. Yep, excellent. And uh, yeah, so the links here at the bottom. Um, if, again, if you're new, we always have uh, atomicredteam.io, which leads you to more of like our more direct landing page for Atomic. Um, and then atomicredteam.com will take you to all the previous content and everything else we've written for it. Okay. And then also inside the Atomic folder, the kind of meat of what's in there is inside of each folder that starts with T, so that T is a technique number from the minor attack framework. So inside Atomic, you'll find a bunch of T folders. And inside of there, every folder has at least a markdown file and a YAML file. So the YAML file is, uh, defines the test. So it gives a description and a name and whether the test is for Windows, Linux, OS X, uh, whether it should be run with command prompts or PowerShell and then the commands that are associated with it. So you see the example here uh, where the markdown file, if you click on that, that's a very nice human readable thing. So really the markdown is just generated from the YAML file, and but it just makes it nice and readable. At the top, it, it reads in the description of the attack technique from MITRE. So that stays updated. And then it lists out the individual test. And, here I've clicked on atomic test number 10, and you can see all the details, uh, what platform it's for, what commands get executed when you run it. So that's also a great way to start investigating what atomic red team is. Yeah, it makes it easy. Very human, human-y readable, clicky. Yeah. So a few things on just installing and being able to run. It's a good idea to use like a standard build that uh, your employees would get maybe suggesting that you disable the AV because there's some files to be executed that might be blocked 
when you download it. Um, make sure your monitoring is in place so your logging is going and you're going to be able to detect things, attacks as they happen. And of course, have permission to test before you run these tests. <clears throat> And so for this example, to install, it's just highlighting that you need to install from an administrative PowerShell prompt. And then this is all on the web, all on my GitHub readme as well. But you can invoke a command to download the installer from atomicredteam.com, uh, just like shown there. Or the next step will show you how you can just run it manually. So if instead you just want to pull down the code yourself from GitHub, you can click on the cloner download link and you can download the zip and extract it, or you can use git clone if you're familiar with that. So you get the code, you need to have the PowerShell YAML module installed, and uh, that, that helps read those test YAML files that define the test. So once you've got that, and anytime you want to run it in the future, you just can import the module. And here I'm doing it from you know, a certain folder, but you need to import that invoke atomic red team .psm one file. And that'll get you started. Perfect. That was easy. <laughs> so you got the two easy methods. You could use just the standard PowerShell download or go and manually do it. Um, when you're when you're getting started, Carrie, what's you got a new environment and whatnot, what which method do you prefer? Um, I just do the git clone way because that's the way I'm always used to and can kind of like see what's really happening and uh, maybe debug it a little easier instead of just pushing ma the magic button. <laughs> 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 kind of old school. It's like those people that won't put writing code in Zoom, you know. It's like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, I... it's easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I prefer the zip method as well and just kind of drag it in there and unzip it and go from there. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Easy enough. Um, so hopefully everyone's pretty level set. We're all, you know, just pretty standard, typical install it, um, kind of get basics, get going. And so the reason why we're here today on this Atomic Friday is Carrie's been contributing a lot of new uh, features and functions into invoke atomic red team for us and it's it's great it really changes the game and I think it's a lot of a uh, lot of requests that everyone's been asking for and I yeah I'll just we'll just hop into it and carry <laughs> I think it's gonna be good okay. so okay. I'll let you run it <laughs> so the first time that I tried this out and I followed the instructions which is the old way here it says, you know, get your atomic techniques and you call get atomic techniques and pass in that path. And then you can evoke that particular technique. And I typed that in about once and I was like, oh, that's too painful. I know I want to run C1117. Why do I have to type so many letters? And so the first thing was like, just let me tell you what technique I want to run and, and that's good enough. And of course, I'm capitalizing on the fact that if you run this from the right folder, meaning it works with the default path to atomics folder. So I'm running it from somewhere where dot dot slash dot dot slash atomics works. Then I can really simplify and just say invoke atomic test P1117. So this is nice uh, for. Yeah, so you, so if, like in certain use cases, I think this was one of yours too, was if you had a path where your all your atomics were in a different place, you would just tell it the path and and just kind of run it out of there, right? Yeah, so yeah, a nice like feature looking ahead is if, if you've got all the atomics from say the public repo, but you want to have your own private test that for a variety of reasons you don't want to share publicly, then you can use all the same functionality and just point it to your private atomics repo. Yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome. It's great. Yeah. Cool. So uh, there was also a separate script called invoke all atomic tests instead of what it was invoke atomic test. Um, that 
ended up causing me a lot of work to keep updated every time I changed the base in Voc Atomic test. So now that instead of using a separate script to run all the tests, you can just give a tag of all and it'll run all the tests. And that keeps the code more maintainable. Yeah, that's nice for sure. <laughs> I feel like we had like a or two or three line script somewhere that that we had in there to run through all the tests. I remember it was something yeah. pretty crazy at one point. <laughs> yeah. And then this is just showing that I renamed generate only to show details because I had no idea what generate only meant. And on the readme it says, if you use a generate only flag, it will only generate the test. And I'm like, you can't use the word in the definition because I still have no idea what generate means. Like, <laughs> And, and really, ultimately, I figured out it means I'll just print the information to the screen for you. So I just I just renamed it because I, I didn't have a, a good first impression of generate all these fire But it is a it is a handy feature. So if you just want to see what would it do, I mean, you could go to the website and look at those markdown files. So sometimes you just well, and the other thing is sometimes there's some variables that aren't filled in, like on the on the markdown file, it'll say execute, and then it'll have like a variable, whatever you want to execute, and it'll read that from the input parameters. And sometimes you just want that all filled in, and this will fill it in. So um, you can see the actual command without like variables that need substituted. And then you can copy and paste from there. So that's really nice for copy and paste and to just get a quick look at what am I really about to do. Yep, definitely. Yeah, generate generate only. It was uh yeah, it almost should have been like generate an output to a file in a way, but yeah, it's I like show details much better. <laughs> Sweet. All right, and then as you saw some techniques like 1089, they have this 10 different tests under there. So I'd be interested in running one of them, but I only had an option to say which technique I wanted, which would run everything. So I added in this option where you could specify either test number, and those are the attack numbers over there on the left, or test name. And so you would only invoke the specific test you were after. And I like the test name because I'm a little bit worried that in the future future, some test number may change. And what used to be test number eight is now test number nine, and I'm not running what I think I'm running, but that's much less likely to happen if I write my scripts to do it by name. So the name may change and my test won't run, but I won't accidentally run the wrong test. So yep. I like that. Actually. Yeah, I agree. I think we had a, a little discussion of this in the Atomic Slack as well, just sort of, you know, which method to take either by number or name, or if you could even do it by number or name previously. I think this is an excellent, excellent feature, you know, when you're trying to automate different portions out of, uh, you know, T1089 or, you know, even like the PowerShell execution one. Um, it just helps, definitely. Great yeah, feature. and the, the test numbers, like if I'm looking at the markdown file on the web page and I go, ooh, look, uh, test seven looks interesting, then the easiest thing for me to type, you know, when I'm just manually playing around is going to be test number seven instead of the whole thing. But if I'm writing a script that's going to run 10 tests for me and I'm going to run this daily, then I'm going to want to use the name so I don't run into that problem where I accidentally execute the wrong test. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Very easy. Okay, and then oh, I added some elements to the YAML files that define test. And those are the elevation required attribute. So you set that to true or false. So if the command, the attack needs to be run from the elevated command prompt to use the elevation required to true. And then on the markdown file, that'll be noted. You can see this uninstall sysmon has elevation required is true. And you see that extra note that after run with command prompt, it says elevation required. So now when you're looking through the readme, you can immediately see whether you need to run this from the elevated command prompt. 
And then I also added these prereq commands, so prerequisite commands. So now you can ask Atomic to tell you does the system I'm on meet the prerequisites for running this attack. So maybe a certain tool needs to install or a certain service needs to be running. So in this case, it checks to see that this mom is running. And if it's not, then running this test isn't going to be much good because the attack isn't going to work. And then also cleanup commands. So I found it hard. I run a test and uninstall Sysmon, but if I want to play with it again or do it again or just uh, be done for the day, I really want to reinstall Sysmon. So now you have these cleanup steps that at the end of the day you can say, uh, give it the switch to run the cleanup commands and then kind of put your system back to the way it was. And it's not foolproof. Uh, you know, right now it's reinstalling Sysmon, but you know, there's no guarantee you had Sysmon installed in the first place. So it isn't exactly like reverting as well as like reverting to a snapshot was, but it, it tries to put things back in a better state. You know, if it made something insecure, put it back to secure. And, and if it created a file, get rid of that file, that kind of thing. Yeah, all, I think all three of these are what we've always talked about doing and, and you did it. <laughs> um, even providing just people, you know, whether elevations required on this or not, I, you know, these are all pieces. And we, we get a lot of comments asking for cleanup. So those are very welcomed. Um, I'm pretty sure for a lot of people, you know, and, and not every test has these. I mean, the, the pieces are there, right, in the YAML, but I, not all the commands are in there for cleanup. Um, prereq pre commands and whatnot. So those are all really good opportunities for contribution right there. Um, if you're looking at a new test or old test, if you want to contribute, those pieces will just start helping build these out and uh, make it very powerful for anybody automating a lot of this. Yeah. That's great. Cool. Okay, so we have, we talked about the show details tag. If in the middle there, I'm running show details, and that's just the standard way to do it. It's going to give me the details for T1089 test number 10, and it shows that this attack will just run sysmon-u to uninstall sysmon. But if you wanted to have, have it tell you what would it do for the prerequisite checks or what would it do for the cleanup check, you can add that check prereq switch, which is how you actually run this check prereq. But if you do check prereq, the show details, it won't run the prereq check. So it'll just show you what it would do to check it. And the same for cleanup. So with those three commands, you can basically read out the commands from the YAML file with the variables filled in. So that can be handy too. That's awesome. Easy additions, very helpful. Yeah, so as mentioned, you can now include this check prereq flag. And so there's a couple different scenarios. This is an example of a test that requires elevation. So it has an elevation required attribute in the YAML set to true. So if you run this from a, an elevated PowerShell, you, it'll say the prerequisite isn't met because elevation is required, but you didn't provide it. So it could be that this one is running. So in that regards, it does pass the prerequisite check, but since you're not elevated, it, it fails the prereq check. So um, the second example is an example where we're running the check prereqs from the elevated command prompt, but Sysmon isn't installed. So you see that error message is a little different. Um, it's not unhappy with our elevation, but it's just saying that Sysmon isn't installed or that the prereq check didn't pass. And then lastly, if you run it from an elevated command prompt, and in this case, this month installed, which is what it was checking for, you'll get a green. So you can run this, you can do invoke atomic test all dash check prereq, and it just blasts through um, every atomic technique and tell you which one you need prereq for. Uh, the only issue being that prereqs are only written for a couple tests at this point. So we've got that framework in there. And going forward, people will, you know, people who come in and define new tests will see that that's one of the attributes you can add, and hopefully we'll get people adding more prerequisites, and I'll be adding them as I use tests as well. Yep. Yeah, I think we're 
think internally too, we're going to throw effort together to try to go through and knock a bunch of them out as well. Um, there's so many tests and yeah, it'll be, it'll be worth, you know, spending that time and adding the elevation and whatnot. And yeah. Yeah. It'll be worth if it. there's nothing defined, so there is no, uh, prereq command attribute in the YAML, then this will just report it as passing. Okay. That's good to know. Cool. Okay. So just a note on defining prereq commands. It's a little different if you're defining them for the command prompt versus PowerShell. So I just wanted to cover that. So if your executor is the command prompt, then every line item, so you could have multiple uh, commands to run each on a different line. Every line item has to return a zero, saying that that, that um, command returned successfully. And so here we're querying for, uh, querying for syslon, and it, it is running. So the, the return the return code for that was zero. So that would be a pass to pass. But then you see in the little window on the left, it says syslon dash u. So I uninstall syslon, and then I run SC query syslon to see if it's running again, which of course it isn't. And then I look at the return code, and it's not zero. It could be any number of others than zero, but it's not zero, which means we failed the test. So for command prompt executor, every command that you put in there, and there can be multiple, each one of them has to return zero for success. Cool. Or, to pass, or to pass the prerequisite. Yes. <laughs> so for PowerShell, so it's a little different because the PowerShell commands are executed as a script block, so all together. So it won't run the PowerShell commands individually as line items, but the whole script itself, the script block, has to return either zero or, or not for pass and fail. So here in this first example, it's checking, you know, it's getting the syslon service and seeing if it's running. And if it is, it returns zero, otherwise it returns minus one. So in the first case, it returns zero. And so we pass our prerequisite. And uh, then we uninstall syslon and we run it again. And now we're returning minus one, so we've failed that check. So you can see if you had multiple things to run, they should be all part of uh, one script that returns one return code, either pass or fail. Nice. Um, cleanup command. So we have this example that after we uninstall Pitmon, if we want to run cleanup, we just do the same command line we did before, but we Tack on dash cleanup and it'll run those cleanup commands. So in this case, it would reinstall this month. Yeah, there's so much, so much ripe opportunity here for contributions. <laughs> um, random question Can you add in multiple cleanup commands? Like if you have two different ways to do it? Have you tried that? Well, you can have multiple commands, but I'm not sure if you meant two different ways. Um, yeah. Like two ways I to. Mean, if, yeah, if you try, if you had two commands that did it two different ways, and you put them both in there, then it would try to reinstall it twice. At this point. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. So thinking like one and PowerShell it, and one regular. Yeah. And it is a little bit limited in that the commands, the prereqs and the commands and cleanup commands all have to be in the same executor. So you might have a quick, easy cleanup command, you know, for PowerShell to install this one, but since this executor is command prompt, everything needs to be command prompt. I, I don't want to go to the trouble to add that complication yet. If, if we can, I mean, you can do it in either. So I, I think we just all need to be more flexible. <laughs> yeah. and, yes. And figure out how to do it in the other one if we don't know how. So. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. Um, cool. Let's see. So input arguments. So just a quick review of that. These have been there for a while, but you, you can see in this indirect command execution that there's three inputs that you can give. So down, you see the commands that are run. It's going to execute TCA 
lua.exe on whatever you define for the process, whatever you define for the payload path, and whatever you define for the CPL, payload CPL path. So those are input parameters, and in the YAML, there's defaults defined for those. So if you just run this test as is, it's going to fill in calc.exe, uh, temp payload.dll, and java cpl.cpl for the last one. So those are input parameters, and they're always filled in to, to default, but you may want to use different than what's defined in the YAML. So your option before now where you could edit the YAML, which is okay, but then, you know, as you pull updates from GitHub for the code or pull down a new zip file and install it on another system, you're always going to lose those changes you've made to the YAML because they're not what come from GitHub. So I wanted an option to be able to specify at execution time what my input arguments were. And that's what we have on the next slide. So now we have this option on the second line, you see the dash input args, and I'm passing in my args. So that's just a hash table full of key value pairs. So here I have my args for process. I wanted to use command.exe, and on the previous slide it had calc.exe. And for the payload CPL path, I'm going to use my.cpl instead of they had java cpl.cpl or something on that one. And for this demonstration, I'm specifically only setting two of the three input parameters. So if you you don't have to specify all of them, but whichever ones you specify will override the default. So here I'm overriding the first and the third input arguments by invoking it with dash input args, giving it my hash table. And then I'm running it with show details. So all it's doing is printing out the commands that will run. So we see Instead of running PCA Lua on calc.exe, we're running it on command.exe. And the last one, instead of the Java CPL.cpl, we're using my CPL. So it's a way for you to override those defaults um, without having to change the YAML. Um, so you can just add this to maybe a script that you run that does the thing. You know, runs the test you're interested with the input arts that you like or that work in your environment. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good way, to, like you said, to script it and to have generated ready to go and using your own payloads or whatnot, or you want to change certain command line arguments, you can just run your own stuff. That's great. Yep. Oh, I think this okay. is, I think this is the big one a lot of people have been asking for. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, before now, there was no logging being done, so you run a test, but there wasn't really a record of that. And and so I've added this logging to it by default. Um, if you don't specify otherwise, it will just write in the current directory where you're executing the test a file called invoke atomic test execution log. And right now, it's filled with the execution time in UTC and then the local time for the machine you're on the technique number and the test number and also the test name. And so that's a CSV file. So that's important to, that it's like a standard format and machine readable. So you can take this, well, you, you can look at it manually and say, okay, we ran these tests at this time. You can go over to your detection systems and see you know, what detections you had for these tests you run. And hopefully you find a correlation for most of them. Um, but even further, to automate that, if you have the same sort of way to integrate with your detections, you can start automating a dashboard. You say, run my test, now look at my execution, and so, you know, have a script that fills out a dashboard, uh, letting you know how you did, um, if you did worse or better than last week, maybe, and um, compare that to the MITRE attack matrix and look where you have holes. So you've got coverage here, here, and here, but you're missing these things. And it's also a good way to show improvement uh, week over week. So maybe to management, you can say, you know, what, three months ago we started this, and this is what our dashboard looks like for detection and coverage. And and now look at it; we've made these big improvements. And then if you don't want it to log, you can add the no execution log, which there's notes at the bottom here. You can specify different log log name and 
uh, nothing gets logged unless the attack executes. So if you're running prerequisite commands, that doesn't get logged, or cleanup commands, or, or just showing details. So it's only the actual attack. Great. Thanks for putting it in UTC. <laughs> Yeah. Things. <laughs> yeah. Once once you start dealing with logs and time zones, you can see comes your best friend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. And oh, then looking ahead. Yeah, coming soon. Uh, I noticed that there's some inconsistencies with the atomic folder like here we have t1191 it's got the markdown file and the yaml file for the test which you expect but then it's also got the payload files the inf scp and files right there in it so this can get kind of ugly as there's a lot of payload files for a given test so to clean that up we'd like to see it where the main folder uh, just has the markdown and the yaml file that you expect but then anything any supporting files for the test would go into subfolders and that keeps that structure clean. So my friend JB, Sheriff E J B, uh, he's working on that and he'll be submitting that soon. So thank you for that. Sweet. Um, we did have one question come in on the on the on the execution framework. Um, as far so the question was uh, you know, does the default command logging also exist in Linux and OS X? Um, so today, this is for this is the PowerShell Invoke Atomic Red Team. Um, so for the Windows framework, and and we, Carrie and I had also talked about uh, if this would work on Mac and Linux. So using PowerShell on Mac and Linux, and we I don't think we've tested it yet, Carrie. Yeah, I haven't tested it, but I'm interested to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and we There's do have to... <laughs> probably a few little tweaks that would have to be made, but. It's probably not that far from being an option. Yeah, use, yeah absolutely. And then the the Python and the Ruby framework that are in the project today, we we haven't modified them, at least as far as I know, to have uh, like logging like this built in. Um, but I would assume because it's in Python and Ruby, it would be easy to add that in or you know modify the code. And, um, have it export as well. Um, cool. Hope that helps. Cool. And actually, we just we also got another one here, <laughs> right related to the variable names. Um, do we have plans to standardize the variable names used within the test? Um, so, like for instance, the input variable names between two different tests may or do vary now. Um, it'd be nice if the variable names could be made consistent across those tests. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got a slide on that about how you can contribute. We'd love to have improvements like that, and it can be a little scary to do your first pull request. I think that about a year and a half ago, I didn't even know what a pull request was, and it scared me when people said it because it didn't make sense to me. And some of, you know, I had to have somebody hold my hand, but. You know, it's really, uh, there's some good tutorials out there. So if you see something that just is inconsistent, uh, we encourage you to jump on board and and make some improvements like that with us. Yep, yeah, and feel free to hop on like the Atomic Slack and ask some questions in there. The whole crew, everybody's in there. Um, lots of people listening, feedback, and, and how others are using it as well, and like, yeah, we're we're very open to it. Uh, we also want to make sure like the base atomic is is available to everybody, easy to use. Um, but if you have something that you know you notice within the project, yeah, definitely feel free to put in a a pull request with your changes. And we'd love to check it out and see how we can adopt it and make it better for everyone. Um, yeah, it. Um, one other one one kind of one quick question came in, and we'll move on here too, Carrie. Um, question was, is do we have any, any of these tests have a way to broadcast beyond a single host that they run against? Um, today, it's just a single host. We don't have, we do have some test, uh, we do have like a WMIC process called create uh, remote 
process called create whatever that Wimic one is uh, that allows you to spread it to another machine. Um, but beyond that, there's nothing built into our frameworks today that allow you to say like, here's five computer names and go run these tests. Um, you could obviously create a script that says run these tests or push the framework to those machines and then run them through like a remote script or PowerShell remoting or something. Uh, but nothing's built into it today. Uh, Casey and I, we had always talked about like having something like that built right into like Invoke Atomic, for instance, and you could say, hey, I got five machines, run these, you know, now using what we have now, you can say run these five tests against those five machines. Um, we just hadn't gotten there, but I think we're very close to it today. Yeah, I, I so, think yeah. a little, little bit different way to interpret that question is just wondering if, if like a payload would move laterally and kind of, you're just trying to attack the machine you installed Atomic on, but then all of a sudden you deploy the bot on five other machines accidentally because that's what the attack does. Mm -hmm. um, do you okay. have thoughts on that? Um, it, yeah, it shouldn't, um, uh, yeah, the, I, I don't think any of the tests are made to spread. Right. Um, so yeah. And, you know, it's just more making sure you, you limit it to a testing lab, not a corporate laptop, your own personal IT laptop machine or whatnot, and trying yeah. not to go crazy. But, yeah. Yeah. So you really, you really do need to, um, review like, do that show detail or read the MD file and just review and understand what the test is doing before you run it. Because this is an open source project. Uh, new tests are added all the time. To definitively say this wouldn't affect something else, you know, we can't, we wouldn't be able to determine that. But, um, but you know, we give you that ability to look at exactly what it's going to do before you run it. And yeah, and I don't recommend running the all option because that <laughs> that is just kind of blindly like uh, lighting the fuse on the computer and blowing it up. So yeah, cool. All right, hop over to the next slide here. Um, so you're more yeah more stuff coming soon. Yep, uh, we also have. Waken working on his first pull request and uh, with some help from JB again uh, to add some additional tests like RDP into a domain controller. That's probably something uh, you want to know when it happens. It, you know, it isn't necessarily bad, but if it's happening at weird times or by people you don't expect or even even by uh, a user that doesn't even have access to the domain controller, it, it begs the question, why is this person even trying to see if they can RDP? Um, that could be a attacker who just found threads who are just trying out their luck. Um, deleting prefetch files, uh, um, setting the registry to store plain text passwords so Mimi Cat will work. Accessing unattend.xml, which is a system press file that can contain credentials. So it's it, you know, it only is used at the time the system's built and it might still be hanging around. So anybody who's going and looking in there uh, is probably wrongly looking for credentials that they could escalate their privileges with. So it's something to keep an eye on. Um, doing a large reverse lookup of IP addresses, maybe on, on a Flash 24 network and the internal network would be unusual. So for adding that test. And then just additional net user net group enumerations for valuable, uh, particularly valuable groups in the domain that an attacker might be enumerating. Sweet, that's great. Um, reading these, it reminded me that, uh, I think we talked about it on a previous Atomic Friday, but uh, Atomic Red Team is also uh, default now on Detection Lab. Um, for Chris Long, it's on GitHub, it's just Detection Lab, and Atomic comes down on each one of the machines. So if you want to build a really good quick lab environment using Vagrant um, within Detection Lab, it'll put up four lab machines, three lab, three Windows lab machines, and then you can actually use from a Windows 10 box and like you, like you could here, RDP to the domain controller. 
Um, it does log everything and tosses it right into Splunk. So you can like quickly go and start analyzing that way. Um, and then, then you can always like add in your own products and stuff too. But yeah, this is excellent addition. Yeah, the detection lab would be a great way to get started playing with this and get comfortable with it. Yeah, yeah, especially when you just need a lab. <laughs> you don't want to build a domain controller and deal with all that fun stuff. <laughs> okay, so you come you come into Atomic Red Team and you look at the index and you just get completely overwhelmed because there's so much stuff in there and you're like, Oh my goodness, where do I even start? So I just uh, added in some suggestions. So some tests that you know won't blow up your machine, don't have prerequisites or need prerequisites because they use you know Windows built-in stuff. They they don't need to like have your machine rebuilt kind of thing. Yeah, they're straightforward. They're used readily by attackers, they're detectable, you know, all these kind of things. So, you know, some tests in there are a lot more obscure than others, but here's five good suggestions for things that are detectable and easy to run and use as your starting point. So the first is looking for passwords and group policy preference files on the domain controller. So those Everybody in the domain has access to read those files, and those files can contain passwords. So you could and run run the GPG password test test and clearing the system event log on your machine that you're running the test on. Uh, you, you'd be interested to know if people are clearing those logs and trying to hide what they're doing from your detection. Uh, bypassing user account control using event view. Uh, event viewer, so we could launch something without getting the UHG prompt. And we could also, maybe there's application whitelisting in place. Um, an attacker can use register 32 to launch or to execute a, their code without um, getting stopped by the whitelisting. And this particular one launches code that it reads from the internet, so that's a, another suggestion. And then just creating a scheduled task. It's awesome. Easy top five, top five that should generate some pretty solid telemetry, no matter what you're using, right? I still I left my notes to myself saying I still need to add five. <laughs> Yeah. I pay no attention to the notes to myself. <laughs> I was gonna remove it, but it's it's a good Atomic Friday. <laughs> you always keep some kind of thing in there to remind somebody of something. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I, can, I can let you take this one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. So again, uh, feel free to you know if you're new to Atomic, you have some questions or you're just curious what's going on. Um, you know, are you just getting started with it all? Hit us up on Slack. It's all on the Atomic Red Team IO page, or you can just go to this link, slack.atomicredteam.io. If uh, you're submitting anything, um, all of our contribution guides and whatnot are on our GitHub page. It's just, uh, you know, again, Atomic Red Team IO will lead you to it. Uh, any kind of bugs, future requests, hit us up there. And we also have a contributing guide on Atomic Red Team IO. Um, we do give stickers shirts, things like that to those who contribute. So you get some really cool gear from Red Canary. Um, you know, you could pick a shirt that's really cool. It's a nice little website. You get to decide what you would like. So definitely now that we have so much new things to work on, um, you know, you know, if you're if you want to start generating different types of uh, chain reactions is a good one. Um, you can now begin to generate chain reactions using this new Invoke Atomic. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to start testing things differently, submit those things back to us as a chain reaction. Or if you want to chain multiple, take Carrie's top five, uh, put that into some kind of script and just give it back. Like those things just help everybody and get more get things flowing. Um, yeah. Any, any comments or feedback or whatnot, feel free to reach out to research at Red Canary and all of our previous content as well um, is all on atomicredteam.com. It's just a nice little webpage. So, yeah.
that's all our fun content. But if uh, anybody has any other questions or, or whatnot, we'll open it up, open the floor. Uh, yeah, thank you again, Carrie. Thank you and, and your team and, and everybody who's contributing to this. And we really appreciate it over on this end because it, you know, not only helps the community, but it helps us too. <laughs> yep, thank you. Awesome. It's a great framework to start with. For sure. And we got lots of stickers, so we'll we'll ship you more. <laughs> we'll work for stickers. Yes. <laughs> Somebody had a, a picture on Twitter, it was like, we'll work for tacos or, or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Stickers look cool. But yeah, thank you everybody for attending and you know, we'll keep it open for another minute here in case anybody has any questions, but yeah, I appreciate it. Quick and easy Atomic Friday. I don't know if you saw this morning, um, Carrie, but another, um, another one was, uh, we had another submission come in for um, Atomic. It was the, oh, what's it called? DLL hijacking? And I think Process Masquerade had come in this morning from uh, Jimmy. Nice. Jimmy test that came in. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty easy. Yeah, it, I, I think it's fascinating to see the power of the community. You know, you, you contribute to this open source project, but as fast as you can make things, there's 10 other things added. And it's just amazing to see. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. So we got uh, one question here is any other links or recommendations when attackers try to hide under other processes or actually try to encrypt it so it looks like something else? Um, thinking that kind of follows under like process masquerading. What do you, what do you think? How would you interpret it here? Um, is that in the Zoom yeah, chat? It's on the the Q&A, uh, the little Q&A box down there. Oh, that's like a different chat. Uh. <laughs> we can always follow up on the follow-up blog here too. Yeah, I, I don't have a good example of some links right now, but good question. Yeah, I think it's under, I think it's a process masquerade from MITRE, masquerading. Um, we randomly, we just had a test submitted this morning from Jimmy. <laughs> um, we committed that and it does have where he copies a process to a different path and renames it. Um, but yeah, it, it was just committed this morning. You should see it under mo most recent uh, pull request that was committed and merged. Um, if anything, we can follow up on a blog on that for two as well too. Yeah, anytime. So, awesome. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Everybody have a great day. Have a great weekend. And we'll catch up again next month for Atomic Friday. And in between, feel free to join us on Slack or hit us up on Twitter, email, whatever it may be. Thank you so much. Great. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.